Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gregory Saxton. I am field CTO here at CloudFrame. This afternoon, I'd like to discuss the uh, top questions about moving COBOL compute. If you've attended one of my webinars before, you always know there's a there's a rocky quote, big fan. And um, the secret sauce of today, uh, a little, little known hero called cross compile. I've talked about this in the past. And, and the, the real story here is around how CloudFrame's products enable you to do an incremental modernization or a progressive modernization. The so what is that you're in control, you the customer and, and the customer with their partners. And, and what that allows you to do is control the granularity and velocity of change. And that's how you build small successes and avoid failure with our tools. There are no big bangs. I constantly remind everybody that the one big bang that we're all aware of is, is where everybody and everything in the universe was destroyed. There are no big bangs with our products. So first question that, that always comes up is, you know, or a group of questions. I think David collected these from a survey that he ran is, you know, what are my options with moving COBOL? You know, I know I can move COBOL to other platforms, use other COBOL compilers. Um, and, and, and what is this thing cross compile? It's real simple. Um, I think most people right now are carrying something in their pocket or their purse. It's, it's called a mobile phone. That mobile phone wasn't programmed on the platform that you use it on. It was programmed typically on a, a PC, uh, a Linux machine, or, or perhaps a, a Mac, which is also Unix. And, and the output of, of the work that some developer did was eventually compiled, and that compiled code was uh, basically targeted for your, your Android or iOS device. It really doesn't run on the, the machine that you built it on. And that's all it is. It's cross compile just means you're, you're generating an executable program for a different target architecture than the one you're running on. Um, why do you care? Well, the, the opportunity, if you happen to be running COBOL workloads on an IBM mainframe is that CloudFrame provides you opportunities where we can run that code on the zip engine. And I know alarm bells are going off uh, in people's heads who've been in the industry. Um, so we talked, you know, I said earlier that the, the secret sauce is cross compile. What are we cross compiling to? You know, I'll get into that. The simple answer is Java. And IBM is, is really a big advocate of Java on Z. And CloudFrame promotes and enables adoption of Java on Z and zip eligible technologies approved by IBM. Um, so I'd like to think that, you know, we're, we're, if we were both on Facebook, we'd be friends. Um, CloudFrame is a huge advocate of Java on Z. So why do we do this? What's, you know, what's the business case? Um, you know, pe people again ask, you know, how do I know the, the, the juice is worth the squeeze and, and how do I know it's really going to run on the zip and, and save money? So the, the first question is, is really simple. Um, most application owners know how much they're paying to run a, a mainframe system. They probably know in detail, you know, how much certain batch jobs cost if, if they're consuming a high amount of MIPS or, you know, God, you know, even in the top 10 10 percent or top 10 jobs. Um, you know which programs are, are doing it. That's sort of where your business case starts, right? You start with the worst offenders that are consuming CPU. Uh, and, and why do you do that? It's really simple, right? Higher general purpose processor consumption often but not always correlates with higher return on investment by, you know, moving those workloads to the mainframe zip processor or x86. And, and the simple reason is because the cost structures around them provide a lower unit cost than the general purpose processor. For the zip engine, it, it's simply because IBM declared it so. There's no other reason than that. So how do you get there? CloudFrame Relocate. Relocate is one of our products. It's a cross-compile product. CloudFrame Relocate integrates with your mainframe build system, Endeavor or ChangeMan. And by doing so, it will cross-compile the COBOL to become zip-eligible Java. 
because it's zip eligible Java, you also have the opportunity to use Cloud Frame Relocate to shift that workload to any Java 8 JVM, you know, in public or, or private cloud. So it means it can be in your infrastructure, uh, it could be on your laptop, it could be in, you know, uh, Azure, AWS, GCP. We support all of the big ones. Uh, yes, you can run it in a container. It's, um, you know, it, it really all of the options that you can think about for how you want to, you know, configure, deploy, operate and manage are available to you with CloudFrame Relocate. Um, measuring is 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 pretty simple. It's it's a much bigger conversation, but the simple answer is, you know how much general purpose processor compute you're using today. You know what the cost structures are. When you move to a, a different processor or platform, you know what the costs of that are. If you're simply staying on the mainframe and moving to the zip. IBM provides excellent tools and you just work with somebody in your capacity management group. The absolute easiest way to see is you just look at your job, how much CPU is it using today? And then when you rerun it with CloudFrame Relocate, you see the amount of CPU consumption has gone down. You can see how much is run on the zip, um, but that's not going to be in your JES output. So um, the other sort of thing that, that people ask, you know, what type of savings am I going to get if I'm shifting compute over to the zip engine? It's, and there is another, <laughs> another poll just popped up. I love it. Um, so what, what we see in, in our own research and, and development environment and what customers report is, you know, mileage varies. So we, we generally see a range of, of 40 to 80% zip offload. And, and that just depends on, on the type of workload you're running. And, and we'll talk about that in a, in a couple minutes. What's, what's really cool about shifting compute to the zip and running Java on Z is that if your COBOL program uses embedded SQL, the SQL in DB2 becomes zip eligible as well. And what we've seen is that uh, your, your select, your read only type operations tend to get substantial zip offload. So it's not just your COBOL consumption, it's also your SQL consumption. And um, those tend to be the highest consuming type applications. The other sort of interesting, you know, play that I, I like to discuss with, with moving COBOL compute is that Relocate provides the opportunity to simply manage this as an infrastructure modernization. And what's really cool about infrastructure modernization is, you know, anyone who's gone through a mainframe upgrade, which is about every three or four years and has visibility into the cost structures and performance, right? You, you know, IBM's machines get faster with each generation and, and so does Intel and so does all these other customers. The opportunity to just move things over to the zip, a lot of companies don't have substantial offload to the zip. So, being able to take COBOL workloads and make them zip eligible is a huge opportunity for customers to just get more price performance out of their existing IBM mainframe agreements and that platform as a whole. Um, you know, how do you know if it works? You know, we will talk about selecting, you know, the workloads. Um, I get asked this question a lot, you know, are all the platforms the same? And, and the short answer is no, you know, things to think about, data gravity, network latency, processor speeds, IO latency, um, mainframe is super fast with IO. Uh, you move to the cloud, you need to just calibrate and, and pay extra for provisioned IOPS. Um, durability of the, the disk you're running on, right? It's mainframe, um, Mainframe disk tends to be extremely reliable. Uh, cloud platforms tend to provide, you know, nine, 10, 11 nines of durability. Um, if you're gonna run in your own data center off the mainframe, that's great. Just make sure you're doing an apples to apples comparisons to, to assure that, you know, you're achieving the same high availability. Um, bottom line, do your homework. Uh, we're here to consult with. We have a growing partner network that provides expertise uh, for helping select and move workloads as well. Um, so I often, you know, do get asked, you know, is this really infrastructure modernization? And, and as I've said earlier, you know, absolutely. Um, couple of rules of thumb, if you're just uh, going to sort of move on from the, the webinar in, in 15 or 20 minutes and see if you have something that makes sense to move. 
if if you're considering a, a job that uh, and I talk about batch a lot because that's where the the biggest opportunities tend to be if you're looking at uh, using cloud frame relocate to shift compute to the zip uh, our rule of thumb is that the zip and gpp provide about the same msus the the benefit of the zip is those msus are not subject to mlc so increasing zip consumption drives down your mlc for all of the enterprise software running in that LPAR typically. So that is a huge cost savings opportunity for enterprises. If right. you're, cons yes, sorry, David. Oh, I, thought you were, I thought you were gonna change the next slide. I have a question that I want you to address before you move forward, but sorry for interrupting you, go go ahead. Yeah, and then just one other rule of thumb. If, if you're looking at just moving to x86, our rule of thumb is that an i9 provides about 200 MIPS, and we're you know we're using a um, a, a GPP equivalent of 1600 MIPS for the Z15. Again, these are rules of thumbs, but um, what that means is you'll need about eight i9s to replace one GPP. Um, list prices are out there uh, for all the you know public cloud providers, so it's very easy for you to do research on this. Go ahead, David. Yeah, we had a question uh, from the first survey that popped up. Uh, they had a couple of uh, options to select. And uh, the question says, your first survey gave me Linux or cloud as migration destinations, but what about the Windows server system? We have customers uh, running on Windows server, so that's absolutely supported. Um, it's it's a joke with some of the cloud frame engineers that you know we only run Linux systems, um, including the mainframe Unix system services, but of course we support Windows. Okay, thanks, Greg. Absolutely, David. So moving moving an application, th this is probably the biggest area where we spend time working with customers is is how do you figure out what, what applications are a good fit for, for cross compile with cloud frame relocate. Um, if you recall, I mentioned customers typically see 40 to 80% to zip eligibility. And when, when I talk about what are good fits, these are our, 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 our you know, applications or, or parts of applications, jobs, programs, where you're going to see that zip offload um, caveat, you have enough available zip capacity, you'll see that zip offload towards the higher end of that range. And some customers actually have workloads that get more than 80% offload, which is really cool. Um, when I talk about things that are, you know, not a fit or anti-patterns, that means that you're going to be towards that lower end, 40%. And, and some workloads are just going to perform, you know, even worse, and you would just not use them with relocate um, because it wouldn't make sense. So as we go through this now, things that, you know, are, are excellent, really any program that is, that is, you know, computationally intense, uh, very simply, it just means it uses more CPU time. Uh, things like sequential file processing, read a file, write a file, whether it's QSAM or VSAM, cursor processing in DB2. What I will tell you is cursor processing in DB2 just screams when you move to the zip uh, with, with Cloud Firm Relocate. The other pattern which has been really cool is uh, request response processing with MQ. We, we have a customer that actually took MQ workloads completely off the mainframe and moved them out to AWS. They're, they're doing this, you know, with both their, you know, all of their environments, dev, QA, production, um, DR. I didn't realize it at the time, but MQ, in addition to, you know, these, these applications that were just running, you know, hundreds of thousands of times a day, they, they, the combination of the two consumes a substantial amount of MIPS. So the, the combination of moving the application off the mainframe, in addition to uh, moving the queue manager over to uh, a cloud provider just was was really just an excellent opportunity. Um, and I share these with customers because uh, we don't know all the different ways that you've combined technologies to, to build your applications. So this is where, you know, we, we haven't imagined every pattern at Relocate can be helpful. So we really just look forward to, to discussing, you know, what your architecture is and what's the right way to use our products to, to get the most value out of them. 
I'll talk about a, a couple anti-patterns. The most obvious one, um, if, if you have a, a program that uses, you know, very little CPU, there's really no benefit to moving it to relocate because there is overhead involved with spinning up a JVM. So if you don't have a long running job, then, you know, it, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Um, what's interesting about CloudFrame Relocate is, you know, we provide backwards compatibility with being able to call mainframe load modules, read and write vSAM files, integrate with DB2. There's, there's no changes to your source code. There's no changes to your data. And, and that's true whether you're running on the mainframe zip eligible or you're shifting compute off the mainframe. However, as you, you know, look to uh, select different workloads, a very common pattern in, in application design is you have lots of subprograms. And if those subprograms are called, you know, millions of times as you're processing millions of transactions, some subprograms are just still going to consume a lot of GPP if they're running as load modules. And there is overhead to context switching from the zip engine back over to the general purpose processor. So that back and forth, just because of the nature of there being two different processors on the mainframe that, you know, one is ideal for Java and one is the only place COBOL can run, there is just some inherent operating system overhead associated with that that can lead to them being anti-patterns. Um, but other than that, you know, it, it just takes us to our, our next topic, which is performance. And um, the, the one thing, you know, that I like to talk about with performance is everything we're discussing about, you know, how to select the program. Again, th these are rules of thumb. There's, there's no financial consequence to a customer to just experimenting with our product and seeing what the benefits are. And, and the reason that, that I encourage that is sometimes you'll run an experiment and you, you, you have a conversation with us and we can provide some options on what you might be able to change. You know, we like to say there's no changes required, but if something's not a fit and you really need some relief from GPP consumption, this is where having that consultative discussion, maybe there are a couple changes. For example, what if your QSAM files were moved and staged over in Unix system services storage? Suddenly it makes the IO faster. It keeps all the IO running on the zip engine. And those files are still available to COBOL programs or utilities like sort to process. So it's subtle little things like that where we've developed experience and expertise that you know we, we feel like we have something in addition to our product that is going to increase your likelihood of succeeding in a, in a very low risk way. So um, the biggest question that comes up here around performance, right? Um, is, is it equal? Is it better? I, I like to say it's similar, right? What's really interesting about the zip processor is that once a task or workload is dispatched on it, unlike the general purpose processor, workload manager doesn't preempt it to run something else. So it's not constantly interrupting the task. So what we've actually seen is that like that's really favorable for computationally intense, wor intense workloads because it means it's going to run until it does something that requires a context switch like an IO or calling a load module. And in situations like that, which we're seeing more and more, the Java code actually runs faster than the COBOL. And you're getting all the financial benefits as well. Now, you know, what I will say is the opposite is also true, which is, you know, why we talk about, you know, workloads that are, you know, a favorable fit versus, you know, those that are anti-patterns. Um, and then the, um, the other topic about, uh, you know, functional equivalency. What, what functional and data equivalency means, if, if this is a terminology that you've never heard before, is these are these are terms that CloudFrame uses and, and other companies that are in this category to describe the behavior of the code that's gone through cross compile or transpile. And the, the objective is that when, when, when you're done and you run this, you know, you use CloudFrame relocate to, to run your workload as, as zip eligible Java, that you get the same outputs as if you had run a COBOL program. And 
it's it's really simple. We do this in our regression testing. When when customers adopt our product, they'll typically go through a pilot with you know 30, 60, 90 days of, of parallel runs against their existing production. And and we put a process in place to just snapshot the outputs from both, you know, both the existing COBOL application and the cloud frame relocate version of it. And then we just use a binary compare tool to compare the data. So, you know, other than temporal things like, say, a timestamp, um, the, the date is going to be identical. And that's about the easiest way of testing that 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 I think you can do testing. Um, the, the so what the conclusion there is that not only are we focused on providing, you know, similar, equal or better performance, but also on functional equivalence. You're not making any changes to your code or data. And if you don't get identical results, we consider it a bug and we fix it as part of our standard maintenance agreement. Um, that's, that's really, again, just another way that this tends to be a very low risk way of proceeding. David, like my spidey sense is telling me you're about to interrupt me. Am I wrong? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm going to keep. <laughs> I was just wanting to make sure you had the chance to, to, to put in there the similar or better. <laughs> okay. I'm going to keep going then. Thank you. All right. Oh, mistakes. Oh, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's funny, you know, mistakes used to, I remember a time in my career where nobody likes to admit they make mistakes. You know, you go on an interview now, people will talk, you, to, you know, ask you about what mistakes you've made um, because they recognize, you know, that's how you learn. And, and just, you know, both as a company, as a team, as an individual, mistakes are suddenly good. Um, mis mistakes are good as, as long as you make them in a way that, that, doesn't just cause really catastrophic outcomes. So sim simple avoidable mistakes, right? If you're looking to shift compute to the zip, um, have a conversation with people in your capacity management team, right? Make sure that that they have sufficient zip. Uh, these these don't need to be long conversations. Um, if you're looking to do uh, a, you know, like a, a large scale proof of concept and then eventually a pilot, you're definitely going to want to involve people in your mainframe um, performance and capacity organization because they're going to be the people who really help you prove the business case that we talked about earlier. They're also going to be the people that help forecast how much zip you're going to need and you know what are the benefits or, or consequences of freeing up all the general purpose processor compute that you're suddenly making available by taking advantage of cloud firm relocate um, we we talked about you know unix system services right so another another common mistake is is not looking to optimize you know data where you can so cloudframe provides emulation of vsam and qsam files and we do that both on and off the mainframe. A very common pattern in batch jobs is you may have output from one step that's only used by a, a, a step later in the job. There's there's no need for that data to be you know processed in a way that adds latency and and GPP to the job. So if you're running on the zip, keep the data in Unix systems uh, services storage. If you're shifting compute off the mainframe, keep it in storage local to the compute platform where you're at. Um, other issues, you know, just not recognizing the, the limitations of network latencies and data gravity. It's completely reasonable to shift workloads off the mainframe as long as they are tolerant of, of network latencies. Um, you certainly would not do that with, with a, a production workload, but for development workloads, you know, it's often completely reasonable to add, you know, fractions of a second of latency. Um, you know, I'm not saying that you must do that, but it's just something to consider. Obviously, uh, you know, we talked about workloads that are anti-patterns. Don't force everything into CloudFrame just because you're moving some jobs, right? It's, 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 it's not a hammer and everything's a nail. And um, the, the other one that's been popping up, and I find this really interesting that, that nobody thinks about it is, 
your, your information security policies for data in motion and data at rest are just things that no one ever thinks about when they're running mainframe workloads or shifting compute, you know, with CloudFrame relocate to the zip. It's all sort of self-contained and managed for you. If you're suddenly using CloudFrame relocate to shift compute off your mainframe, well, where you install the CloudFrame relocate software off the mainframe, whether it's Windows or Linux and whatever network it's in, you have suddenly become the proud owner of a whole bunch of new security requirements that have been imposed upon you because that is just what is expected when you're operating in that environment. So you have additional responsibilities for data in motion and data at rest. And you know, ignoring those just basically leads to a lot of pain and suffering for everybody involved. Sometimes it leads to bad headlines too, which you really want to avoid. Best practices, um, do the opposite of everything I just said. Uh, and and I, I said this earlier and I'll say it again. If you are looking to, uh, to, to work with vendors to exploit the zip, use products that comply with IBM's terms and conditions of use, such as CloudFrame Relocate. If you're shifting off the uh, mainframe, right? We, we, we talked about, we just talked about network latencies. We talked about information security process, uh, policies. Um, we've, we've talked about, you know, low hanging fruit, right? Picking the right workloads. Um, the things that we haven't talked about just, and, and this gets overlooked a lot too in POCs, basic project management hygiene. Talked about this early on in the CloudFrame journey, probably two years ago, but simple things, right? Like get us, you know, get your stakeholders together, plan a significant pilot that people actually care about. Don't, don't prove something that nobody cares about. Don't, don't try to save money on a report that costs $3 to run that nobody reads, right? Pick something significant. The customers that we're working with, we're working in all of their critical systems. Right. So the determine success criteria. And this isn't something you do in a vacuum. This is something you do with, you know, with broad cross, you know, cross functional stakeholder involvement uh, and, and really like, you know, execute with transparency. We talked about, you know, engaging with people in capacity planning and um, performance teams. You, you, you want as much transparency and eyes on this as possible because that's how you get results that are believable and that's how you drive meaningful change in your organization. And, and as you move from a POC into a, you know, into like a real project and eventually a pilot, early on you want to start thinking about how are you going to manage this in production and how am I going to make this available in DR? There's a lot of environments above where you're doing your work in, in a proof of concept. Now we've had customers go end to end from doing a, a POC with CloudFrame to production in DR in six months. So it's, it's all doable, right? But it needs to be part of a plan. And then of course, rinse and repeat. The, the pattern we see over and over with, with projects is that once customers start to experience success with one of our products, it just attracts a lot of eyeballs. And, and then you start having products all over the company take off. And this is where, you know, the, the best practices that you develop are just going to help the next team that, that works with one of our products. Um, so with that, uh, David, did you have any other questions? We had one that came in, Greg, around a reference that you made of MIPS equivalents. Oh, sure. Yeah, that was on the, the slide for uh, compute infrastructure. So what I said is our rule of thumb, if I know absolutely nothing about your workloads today, my assumption for this year is that a, a zip and a GPP are equal in terms of MSUs that they provide. I know they're not, but for, you know, as a starting point, that's my assumption. I also assume that a Z15 GPP provides about 1600 MIPS and that an i9 is uh, like an Intel i9 is capable of providing about 200 MIPS. So if you wanted to replace a mainframe GPP with uh, an Intel processor, you would need an i9 with eight cores and the code would need to be designed so that it takes advantage of those eight cores. Hint, hint, ours does. So we had a question that says, if you don't mind, please revisit the data access question from Java. 
So when migrating COBOL applications to Java, what happens to data access code of, of the applications? Consider vSAM and other databases running on ZOS. So CloudFrame provides uh, native integration to uh, ZOS, vSAM, and QSAM files. So we can read and write those files just like you do in COBOL. Um, and, and we basically handle it. That's intellectual property built into our product. We use JDBC for accessing DB2, and we do that when we're running on Z or if you're shifting compute off the mainframe. We also provide emulation for vSAM and QSAM files. So if you're shifting compute off the mainframe or you want to stage data in Unix system services storage, that you have the option to do that. Now, the emulation that we provide is proprietary to CloudFrame. So it would not be a data structure or a file that would be accessible to COBOL. But reading existing mainframe vSAM and QSAM files, um, that is something we do out of the box. We peacefully coexist with everything else on the mainframe. Great. Thanks, Greg. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we have one other question. Um, if you're running in the zip, is that still generating SMF records that can be reported on so that you can look at resource usage? Yes, I do not have my SMF decoder ring handy, but you will be able to see um, a great deal about um, GPP and, and zip usage. You'll see things like um, how much zip was consumed, if a workload was zip eligible, did it wait for zip or did it uh, just go over to a GPP? That is a uh, configuration that your systems programmers will set. Great question. Good. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we do this monthly. We have a. Uh...